بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه موالاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Does your mother love you? Is that the topic for tonight? Is that the topic? Okay, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, it's not the topic. Does your mother love you? Now, when it comes to parents and their love for parents, some people when they grow up, if you're not married and you don't have children, you might have some doubt whether your parents love you or not. Sometimes they act in weird ways and so on and so forth, and you're not really sure do they really love you. But, when you have a child, you get a glimpse of a love. You know, it's like, subhanAllah, when you have a child, a portion of your heart that you've never experienced before comes alive. It's a love for your child that you realize that your parents have had all these years. And there's no possible way that you could never love your child. And then you realize that you are the son, you are the daughter of someone else. And that they always loved you. You just may not have consciously realized it. And you may have never experienced it. Now imagine here, there, there might be some children here, there might not be. Do you guys have, are there children here? Let's imagine that in the darkness of this room, one of the childs disappears. Where's the child? Everybody's like, oh, inshallah, they're outside. And people start leaving the, the child's not outside. Oh, maybe they went to the bathroom. No, they're not there. And more people have left and the child is not found. And let's say one hour after this lecture is over, the child still hasn't been found. Two hours after the lecture, this child's still not found, they have to close the doors, child's not found. Let's suppose that even till Fajr, the child's not found. Let's suppose it's the next day. What do you think the mother's going through? What's the mother going through? I don't think anybody understands that unless they're a mother. In the brothers, they don't understand that. Of course, the father has feelings, but not like the mother's feelings. And then, let's imagine that after many, many hours, the mother finds the child alive and safe. What would she do? What would she do at that moment? She'd be like, oh, you scared me. <laughs> what would she do? She would hug him or her, she would cry, she would never forget that, and she would probably ever, you know, ever after that moment, she would never let the child out of her sight, like ever again, because of that scare. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a woman who lost her child for many hours, and it wasn't a child walking around, it was a nursing child, a child that needed the mother's milk. And she lost the child for many, many hours. And she was searching, everybody was watching her fear and her, you know, she, her franticness. And then when she found the baby, just like you said, the mother would grab the baby and cry and hug the child. The mother immediately started giving milk, just her, the, um, the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created her with. She immediately started giving milk to, to the baby, crying and hugging the baby. At that moment, like even the companions عنهم, they were amazed at how much love this woman had by the scene and how dramatic it was in front of them. The Prophet وسلم, took that moment to teach us all a very valuable lesson. So the Prophet وسلم, said, do you think at this moment that that woman would take her child, let's imagine she's crying, she's hugging the baby, and we just gave you a little example, mother finds her baby after all these hours, and then she lights a fire and puts the baby on the fire and burns the baby alive. Would she do that? Why wouldn't she do that? Because of out of her mercy for the child? The Prophet ﷺ said, would she throw her baby in the fire? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, she would never do it. If she had any ability to stop it, she would never allow it to happen. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَاللَّهُ أَرْحَمُ بِعِبَادِهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ بِوَلَدِهَا He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah is more merciful than she is. 
than this woman, more merciful to his slaves than this woman to her child. Just so you understand that. Allah's mercy to his slaves is more than this woman to her child. And so when you realize, when you have a child and you realize that how can my child ever think that I never love them? No matter what you did, you would know that the mother will always love the child. Now you get a glimpse that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wished guidance for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wished guidance for you. In fact, even though everybody's saying, oh, you know, punishment and this and that, it's so you get the message through your head. Who wants you to go to hellfire? Who wants you to go to hellfire? Shaitan wants you to go to hellfire. The verses that talk about hellfire and so on and so forth, Shaitan's the one that says, don't read those. Just live your life, have fun. You know, boyfriend, girl, it's okay. Enjoy yourself. It's Shaitan that wants you, those verses to be implemented on you. And those verses as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes something so difficult. Hellfire is so difficult. But every time you read an ayah that speaks about hellfire, every time, there's a verse that speaks about Jannah, either right before or right after. I call it the, the fire exit. In every room, there's an exit, right? There's a fire exit. That if there's a fire, imagine that there's the, like, imagine there's, a, actually I noticed there's about a whole bunch of fire exits in here. There's about five, six of them in every corner. There's always a way out for you. All these verses that speak in the Quran, so long as you're alive, you have that chance to take the exit. And as the Prophet Wasallam said, like, like the Prophet Wasallam in his da'wah, like moths on a fire, this is the fire and you're being instructed to leave and take the exit and yet like those moths, they insist on going into the fire. And yet it's to said again and again, there's the fire exit, take it, you're gonna burn if you stay in here. And they said, no, we want to burn. This is the promise of shaitan. That they will have some enjoyment in this dunya and that they will live their lives like that and die and they will be burnt. And yet that message of Islam is the fire exit. When someone takes the fire exit, what's waiting for them? Happiness in the dunya and jannah in the hereafter. Because when the person takes the fire exit, they exit and instead choose to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take that path Every good thing that you can imagine in this dunya belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every good thing belongs to Allah azza wa and He can give you access to those things. And so whoever seeks the hereafter, they get the dunya and the hereafter. And whoever seeks the dunya, they don't get the hereafter, and guess what? They don't even get the dunya. They don't get either of them. Because you look at these people, there's this person, um, this Muslim worker, <clears throat> and he was, this Muslim worker was always happy, always smiling, and he was always employee of the year. He always got the best um, awards. So his boss invites him one day. His boss invites him, and he says, multiple years you've been getting employee of the year. You're like our most excellent worker. And he said, and he closed, the boss closed the door, and he said, but there's something else about you that I want to ask you about. He said, you're always happy. You're always happy. And he said to him, I want to know why you're always happy. I want to know why you're always happy. Because the boss is looking for this. The boss is like the CEO, he has all the money, he has the cars, the yachts, the boats, the uh, the uh, vacations, he has everything, but he's not happy. He doesn't have the dunya. And he's still searching for it, and he sees someone that has it, he wants to know a secret. And the boss is actually very intelligent. He's finding someone who has what he wants, and he's seeking it out. So he said, why are you always happy? And so this Muslim worker, he's, he's very happy, and he answers, he's like, because I'm Muslim. <laughs> That's why I'm happy. And subhanAllah, you'll see that there's a lot of Muslims, we were talking yesterday about Muslims being sad. And I said one of the main reasons for the sadness is nifaq, is hypocrisy. That when a person is truly sincere in their ibadah, you can't be sad. 
If you're praying Qiyamul Layl and you're fasting and you're doing, treating people with the highest character and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how could you possibly have time to be sad? It's when you're occasionally missing prayers, it's when you're not paying attention to what you're saying in the prayer, when you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a continued basis, and then you say, I'm Muslim, why am I sad? <laughs> because of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not being fulfilled. So he says to this employee, why are you so happy? He said, because I'm Muslim. So the boss got very, you know, he's, he said to him, he said, if I become Muslim, would I be as happy as you are? He said, if I became Muslim, this is the boss, he's really searching this out. If I become Muslim, would I be as happy as you are? And then this Muslim worker said, no. He said, no. He said, no, you wouldn't be as happy. You'd be more happy than me. He said, because I, all these years, I've been sinning and sinning and sinning. But if you become Muslim, it, all your sins will be forgiven. You'll be starting with a clean slate. You're starting fresh. He said, you'd be more happy than me. And then, and then this, his boss actually went to give a shahada at the masjid. And the imam was actually tell, you know, telling me the story. He said that when this guy came and he gave a shahada, you know, he started crying. And he said that, he's like, why are you crying? And, and people who have converted to Islam, you've reverted to Islam, you're here, you know this moment. When you become Muslim, when you say your shahada, there's like a feeling that you get and you know exactly what this person is feeling at this point, right? And by the way, here's another tangent. That feeling that you get when you become Muslim, I believe that that's a very similar feeling when you see the Kaaba for the first time. And when you see the Prophet's Masjid, and there's a third place that when you see it, you feel the same thing. And that is when you see Masjid Al-Aqsa. They're the same feelings. They're similar. A person becoming Muslim, seeing the Kaaba for the first time, Masjid Nabawi, Masjid Al-Aqsa, these holy places, and that moment when a person turns back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So this guy started crying, and then he said, "I felt a happiness now that I've never felt in my entire life." And he was so, he was crying out of happiness for the happiness that he finally achieved. Now the question is, does Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala love us. There's another question that says, do you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are two different questions, correct? Does Allah love you? And do you love Allah? And there are two different questions coming from two different angles. And we'll be discussing that inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> Firstly, you have Christians you have Christians that believed that Allah loved them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when in the ayah, عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Even though they're claiming that Allah loves them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we were taught to seek protection and refuge and not take the path of those who were misguided. And they're misguided thinking that Allah loved them when in reality they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Jews also claim that Allah loves them. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us to seek out the path, not the path of those who earn the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Those who earned Allah's anger. And Muslims claim that Allah loves them as well. Correct? Does Allah love us or not? Are you sure about that? Are you sure? When you read in the Qur'an of the nations that were destroyed, Iblis, right from the very, Surah Al-Baqarah, right from the very beginning, Iblis, Shaytan, was in the companionship of the angels. The highest companionship, that when Allah said prostrate to Adam, he was in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the commandment went to him. In fact, he's the one, he's speaking to Allah, you know, allow me to live uh, and, and misguide all of the children of Adam. He's having like these conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet he reached the lowest of the lows. You turn the page, then you read about Bani Israel. That I preferred you over all nations. And they went to the lowest of the lows as well. And now you start thinking that there's a recurring theme here. That 
being and getting the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a birthright. It's not something you just woke up one day and you get that position. You have to earn it. And this is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's something that you earn by your deeds. The Prophet ﷺ said to his family members, he said, don't let the other people come on the day of resurrection. These people will come on the day of resurrection with their deeds. And he's telling to his family members, and you come and you say, I'm related to Muhammad ﷺ. That's the only claim that you have to, to the, in the hereafter. The other people are coming with uh, their a'mal and you're coming with your nasab. You're coming with your lineage. He's like, it's not going to avail you anything. You have to come with your actions. And so that's how a person seeks out the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the companions. <coughs> Yet the companions, how many of them were killed shaheed? How many of them were killed shaheed? So many of them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved them, He tested them and He took them back to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala as uh, took him back uh, to himself subhanahu wa ta'ala as shuhada because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't give this position when Allah loves someone he tests the person when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests the person then this this um, slave of Allah passes the test and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved them they pass that test and then they get the high ranks because of their passing of the test correct and so whenever you get these tests your step number one is to recognize that it's a test. Recognize that it's a test. Number two is if it's a test, then it's an opportunity to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an opportunity. Now this is, it sounds nice. We were saying, you know, the issue of sabr and, and so on. We can talk about it. It's just academic information. But let's imagine that someone's child passes away. And we just said, number one, recognize that it's a test. These things happen quickly, right? Child just dies. It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, it's an opportunity to win the highest level of Jannah. How many people think of that when their child dies? Some do and some don't. But these are the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places for us. And we were saying in, in the previous lecture that it doesn't have to be that Allah sends you pain and then you start acting good. You can get the same result through thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can get, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have given you the children, hasn't taken your children away from you, you can still be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such as Maryam, alayhi salam, her mother, she made an oath that her, her um, she, when she was pregnant, she made an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she would dedicate the life of her um, child to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would be a leader. And then she gave birth to a girl. Even if she had dedicated, she's like, Oh Allah, this son in my stomach, I'm going to dedicate him to your worship. And then she gave birth to a girl, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنثَى This is like a problem here. He's, it's not a boy, it's a girl. She says, Oh Allah, I gave birth to a girl. Does Allah know what she gave birth to? So why? she's telling Allah, Oh Allah, it's a girl. <laughs> and the next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu a'lamu bima wada'at. Allah knows better about what she gave birth to. وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُكَ unta, And the boys are not like the girls. So did her mother give up on this girl? No. She had this girl, it wasn't a boy, but she says, Wa inni sammaituha Maryam. I've named her Maryam. Wa inni u'iduha bika wa dhurriyataha min shaytan al rajim. And I seek protection for her and her offspring from shaytan al rajim. And Maryam alayhi salam, as we know, all in all these different cultures, you go from Muslims to Jews to Christians, you go around everybody, what's your name? Maria. What's your name? Mary. What's your name? Maryam. What's your name? All these different cultures, this name is there in everyone. Marianne and so on and so forth. Each, everybody has, and they've revered Maryam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings these tests for us. 
When a person is tested, tested, and they keep doing these good deeds, and then they get to a point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this person. And so at this point, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this person, Allah azza wa jal calls Jibreel and says, Ya Jibreel, I love so and so, so you love this person. And then Jibreel calls to the angels of the heavens, giving the news that Allah loves so and so. And the name is mentioned. Jibreel salam, is mentioning this person's name. Allah loves so and so, and so everybody loved this person. And then when all the angels of the heavens love this person, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts qabul on earth for this person. Puts qabul, meaning the people, they, um, they honor this person, they respect them. And you'll find this, that when you seek out the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though it may anger people, even though it may anger people, so let's say you have some relatives, and they're having a wedding, and the wedding, for example, there's going to be alcohol, even though they're Muslim, there's going to be alcohol there, and there's going to be dancing, and nobody's dressed properly, and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you tell them, I will not attend this wedding. And they get so mad at you. And you're like, I love you know, this relative, I love the situation, so on and so forth, but for the sake of Allah, I will not anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to please you. And you can't do that. As the, the statement is, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There's no obedience to any creation of Allah if it entails the disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is like when you have like family members and so on. I love you, the family members. But if you're asking me to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forget that. <laughs> There's no disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're like, but we'll be mad at you. Do I look like I care? <laughs> I love. There's just like, you know, you've, got, you've gone to a line where you can't cross that. And now, so let's say this, this family, they're very angry. They're like, oh, you know, so-and-so, he's not coming to the wedding, or she's not coming to the wedding. We're so mad at them. And someone says, hey, but you know what? They have principles. That's an interesting thing, principles. I respect them for that. And as time goes by, maybe you know, someone's not talking, this and that, you do your best. As time goes by, subhanAllah, Allah puts barakah in that relationship. And you may find that things went so much more blessed for you in your life. With those relatives even, because you stood your ground. You were a person of principle, and when you stand your ground, you look at the Prophet وسلم, he and actually, the, all these Prophets, when they came to their people, they said things that made people angry. And in one of the um, <coughs> Salih alayhi salam, Prophet Salih, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when he brought the message to the people, the people said in response, قَالُوا يَا صَالِحُ قَدْ كُنْتَ فِينَا مَرْجُوًا قَبْلَ هَذَا They said, O oh Salih, before you made this statement to worship only Allah, we actually had high hopes for you. You know, you could have been, we were going to actually make you our president. You would have been the king. We had such high hopes from you, it's too bad you said that. Now you're crazy. Now you're going to lose status in this society. You're going down. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. The whole nation was destroyed. Salih never regained his position with the people. He was always, from the moment he said that, they always put him down. Now, what is the end of Salih? He's in Jannat al-Firdaus. What is the end of his people? They're in hellfire. Even though he had worked all those years to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the end, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Right? That the aqiba, the final end, will always be for the believers. <clears throat> Humans, we were talking in, in a previous lecture about depression. And one of the main reasons for depression is that a person, a human being, is seeking out the love of other humans. Even though you might be doing your salah, you might not be doing it for the sake of Allah. Such, uh, so much so that when, you know, when there's prayer in congregation, when other people are watching, the person is praying with so much um, strength but when they're alone and it's Fajr time, or when they're alone at some other prayer, they don't have the same energy, and or they are not praying. And the problem there is because there's no human being watching at that point. And because there's no human being watching, they don't have the same energy because even the public prayer wasn't for the sake of Allah. They're both not for the sake of Allah. There's issues going on when the person's not worshipping Allah in private. In fact, publicly and privately, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the same. 
whether someone's watching or not. And this is an interesting thing because some people, they'll worship Allah in private, and then when people are watching, they shut off their worship of Allah because people are watching. So this is like the example. Someone recites very good, very good, very good, and then they come in public, and then they're like, I don't know how to read. This is what I call riya in reverse. Right? Riya showing off and doing actions not for the sake of Allah in reverse. Because in both situations, the person, either they do the action or they're not doing they're doing them both because of the, they're so focused on the eyes of people. Let's suppose you wanted to ask a question here in this audience. You're like, I want to ask a question, but I'm shy. What will the people think of me? Correct? You might be thinking, if I told you, like, everybody, we're gonna, I'm going to go around, everybody's going to put their hands up. Every single person, if I just went and every one of you introduced themselves, every one of you would be, th every one of you would think, what will the people think of me? Everybody's got that in their mind. Rarely, rarely, someone just sort of like, nobody th is thinking about you. <laughs> we said that yesterday. Nobody's thinking about you. You don't have to keep focusing on the people. You focus on the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a question, you ask the question. Doesn't matter who is listening. Correct? You're doing the actions for the sake of Allah. And so the source of love, the source of, Allah, of love, and rather than seeking out the pleasure of people, you seek out the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I tell people when this issue of riya, how do you solve it? What's the solution? I tell them, you know what, if you're going to go pray and you recite really good, you need to show off. But who do you show off to? You show off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You show off to Allah. You have it in your nature that you want to show off. And so you're showing off for the sake of Allah. You're showing off to Allah. And this is the example, the companions will say something like, you know, that if this happens, Allah is going to see what I'm going to do. They'll make a statement like that. I'm going to show Allah. If this, you know, if I get another chance, I'm going to show Allah what I'm going to do. One of the companions would say something like that, and the Prophet ﷺ would say, if you're telling the truth, then Allah is going to prove your truthfulness. They're showing off for the sake of Allah, that Allah is going to see what I'm going to do. And so, you know, actually it's interesting, this is, if I've disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I do, and we all do, and then I have a lecture at night, I actually, you know, in the lecture, I'll say, oh Allah, because of the sin, because of the sin that I've committed, my toba is to rock the microphone tonight, inshallah ta'ala. That's my toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, forgive me this sin, and I will, you know, pass on your message to the people, inshallah ta'ala, to the best of my abilities with ihsan. With ihsan. And even if I do a lecture, if I do a lecture and I haven't prepared for it, and then people say, mashallah, that was a good lecture. I don't care if you say it was a good lecture. If I didn't do my preparation, then I feel bad. Even if you still compliment me, it doesn't make a difference to me. Because I didn't do ihsan in preparing the lecture. And that happens, you see sometimes when people are doing their Islamic activities and so, who cares about the compliments of the people if you didn't do your best? And if you did your best and the people insult something like that, who cares as well? Whether they're complimenting you or criticizing you, it makes no difference. As long as you're doing your best for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa also tells us in the Quran about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved, that we know he loved, was Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah Azza he loved him, so he tested him. All the tests you can imagine, any test that you've been in, someone will say, I'm, you know, I've been through a lot. Let me tell you that you have not been through a lot. If you want to know who's been through a lot, you look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. And there's many more people that have been, and in comparison, what you've been through, and what Ibrahim salam went through, and the prophets went through, this is actually one solution to get out of the problem. You think you have a problem? You tell me your problem. You're like, ah, this happened to me. The Prophet salam, someone called him unjust. And the Prophet salam, like, he's like, it's going to the Prophet salam, insulting him, and saying that, you know, you're stealing the money of the Muslims. And this is the messenger of Allah salam. And so the Prophet وسلم, is also comparing himself to other Prophets. He said, Rahim Allahu Akhi Musa. May the mercy of Allah be upon my brother Musa. Min 
He said, may the, may the mercy of Allah be upon my brother Musa. He was tested with more than this, yet he was patient. And so now, in comparison to what the Prophet said, what were we tested with? You had a child die? The Prophet said, child died. In a baby, all his, actually, for, for those who know, in the seerah, all of the Prophet Sallallahu children died in his lifetime, except one daughter. All of the other children died. During his life, he witnessed the death of all his children. The only one that was alive at his death was Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Correct? And then you go through test after test. What were you tested with? The Prophet, and then look at the test of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And look at the test of the righteous people. They, you know Allah loved them more than He loves you. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still tested them. So who are you to not be tested? And so you're going to be tested with the good things and you're going to be tested with the difficult things. A lot of people, when I say you were tested, they think of the difficult things. But if no difficult thing has happened to you yet, you are still being tested. This um, sister, I said, you know, everybody gets tested. So the sister said, um, she said, what if there's a woman who, she's never, Allah has never tested her. I'm like, Allah never tested her. I thought for a second. I go, it's impossible. It is impossible that Allah never tested this woman. She goes, yes, she's never been tested. She's beautiful. She has money. She's, um, she's always healthy. She's in a very affluent family. And I know some of the brothers don't want to marry like a sister like that. Stuff like that right? <laughs> she has never been tested. And then I said to the sister, I said, I go, did you hear what you just said? The whole list that you just dictated to me, every one of those was her test. Everything that you mentioned, her money, her health, her beauty, all of those things was her test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I go, but you know what's really scary? Is that she doesn't even know that that's the test. And you don't even know that that's the test. Nobody recognizes those things as the test, correct? You always have these lectures, they tick me off, there's a Muslims after 9-11. Like, did we just start getting tested after 9-11? What about 9-10? <laughs> and 9-9 and 9-8 and 9-7, 9-6 and working backwards from there. Were we being tested? And the answer is yes, we were being tested. Tested for our sincerity, tested for our thankfulness to Allah and so on and so forth. And the consequences or the rewards of those tests, whether we passed them or not, came up maybe after 9-11. You'll find some people after 9-11, they left their deen. They were in the masjid and everything like that, but Allah alam about the sincerity. When 9-11 happened, then they left their deen. Okay, this is someone, they said that they were a believer, and Allah tested to whether they were truthful or not. And then the test came and they were like, no, we weren't truthful. Everybody else was saying they're believers, so we just said, let's be believers like everybody else is saying that they're being believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you and I from those who pass their test. I mean. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ibrahim alayhi salam, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا You want a good friend, right? How about Allah being your friend? How about Allah revealing Qur'an that out of the human beings, Allah chose Ibrahim as his friend? That's what Khalil means. Khalil, the friend of Allah. Allah's friend is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Khalilullah. And one of the companions was hearing this, and then he said, when he heard this verse, وَاتَّخَذَ Allah Ibrahim Khalila, he said, قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ أُمَّ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ He said, how, um, how, how sweet it would be for the mother of, of Ibrahim to know that Allah chose her son as his friend. And I thought even what this companion said, and then Ibrahim salam's mother wasn't even Muslim. Right? And she didn't believe in Ibrahim alayhi salam and she was a kafir and died mushrikam and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her son as Khalil. Another person like this, and I, and I thought about this, um, about this verse a lot, was <coughs> Prophet Ayyub. Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna wajadnahu sabira. Allah tested him with so much, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we found him to be patient. Allah tested him, he lost his family, only his wife was left, all his children afflicted with sickness. You know, the definition of patience, Ayyub alayhi salam. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna wajadnahu sabira. And then look at the next statement Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ni'ma al-abd. This is Allah's statement saying, ni'ma al-abd, what an amazing servant he was. Allah is praising him when they say a tazkiyah, right? When you're looking for like a letter of recommendation. This is a recommendation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ni'ma al-abdu innahu awwab. That what an amazing servant he was. Innahu awwab. That he frequently and consistently would repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we've mentioned all, uh, these men. And we were once actually at, um, in, in hajj time. And we were at the... Um, At the Aghari Hira, Jabal al Nur, in Mecca, where the revelation came down, it's a huge mountain. And we're standing there. You can't, it's like, it takes like an hour to climb it. I've never climbed it, and it's very difficult. You might get hurt if you climb it, and so on. Prophet used to climb it. Khadija anha used to support the Prophet. He used to go and sit up there until the revelation came, and so on. You know the story. And one of the sheikhs, um, he was standing there, and he said, Brothers and sisters, he goes, Look at Khadija. Look at Khadija. She was very wealthy. And she, when the Prophet ﷺ came with the revelation, she gave all her money for the sake of Islam. And she died poor. And I told you in yesterday's lecture, don't ever tell me that Umar anhu was poor. And so the Shaykh made that mistake. <laughs> he said that Khadija died poor. Oh man. <laughs> he ticked me off at that point. And I actually, while he was speaking, I put my head down just as I was standing there and I started crying. And then the Shaykh said, Muhammad, would you like to add something? I said, yes, I'd like to add something. I, says, I said, I just want to correct something that was said. I said, by whose standard did Khadija die poor? Whose standard is that? Is it the financial standard of her bank account? Like when she died, we looked at her bank account and we said, no, there's zero dollars in her bank account, therefore she died poor. Is that the standard? That's what I was talking about, Umar. When I said that he was one of the wealthiest men, you might have thought, but what about his clothes? What kind of riding animal was he? That's not the standard. That's the problem. The problem is this is how we judge wealth. We judge it by your car and your bank account digits. This is wealth to us. And so I said, number one, I said, Khadija didn't die poor. She died the wealthiest woman amongst all women that ever walked this earth. And I said, did you know that one time the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with Jibreel ﷺ? This is in Sahih Bukhari. He was sitting with Jibreel ﷺ. The angel Jibreel, who uh, takes the revelation, brings it to the Prophet ﷺ. And then Khadija was coming. Jibreel knows she's coming. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, this is Khadija coming. She's coming around the corner. She's about to enter the room. And he said... Uh, to the Prophet ﷺ, He said, give my salam to Khadija. This is Jibreel ﷺ. You know how you say, oh, you know what, you're going to such and such a country, you're going to such and such a city. Give my salam to so and so. Someone that you love very dearly. Jibreel ﷺ said, when she comes in, give her my salam. Give my salam to Khadija. I said, it's Sahih Bukhari. And then he said, وَبَشِّرْهَا بِبَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ مِنْ قَصَبٍ لَا تَعَبَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصَبٍ He said, she's coming, she's bringing you some like soup. Give her my salam and give her the glad tidings. Give her good news that she has a home in Jannah for her. مِنْ لَا تَعَبَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصَبٍ There's no toil in Jannah. There's no toil in Jannah and there's no, um, there's no hard work and there's no toil in, in, that, in that place. Now, was that Jannah in her bank account before she died? It's sahih. It's an authentic hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. You know, it even reminds me. <clears throat> we, were in, we were in Mecca. And, you know, you had slaves in Mecca. They're slaves. Who loves slaves? They're just slaves. And yet, these slaves that were in Mecca, they believed in the Prophet sallallahu and they were tortured and so on and so forth. And they became the great companions of the Prophet All, Even if I mention some of these slaves' names, all of you know these slaves' names. 
You all know their names. We were in Mecca once, and I was praying, like, in the front row. One of the brothers said, you know, you want to pray in the front row of the Kaaba? In the front row of the world, you pray in the front row of the Kaaba. So first time I went to the Kaaba, I was like, you know what, I'm going to pray in the front row. So I'm sitting there long before the Salah began, long before the Adhan, and we're sitting. And then this, um, this Saudi brother came out. He's very dark-skinned, very dark-skinned. A, a beautiful white thobe and very clean, very crisp, very dark-skinned. And he brings out the microphone. And it looks like he's going to give the Adhan. He wasn't the Mu'adhin. But it looked like he was going to, be, he was going to give the adhan because he's carrying the microphone. He was dressed so beautifully. And there were some brothers uh, sitting beside me from South Africa, some uncles. When they saw this man and they saw his dark skin, they got so happy. I'm t saying they were freaking out. If they had cell phones, they would have picked up their cell phones and, and called home because they were so happy that he had uh, dark skin like that. Why do you think they were so happy? Who knows, why were they so happy? Yes? Why were they so happy? They were saying in their, in their accent, I don't know Urdu very well, but they were saying, Vo Blal's family hai. <laughs> they were so happy because they thought he was going to give the adhan, and because of his dark skin, that he was from the lineage of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And what made them so happy was because there was some resemblance in their minds to Bilal radiallahu anhu because of their um, excessive amount of love to Bilal radiallahu anhu. Because Bilal, love of Bilal radiallahu anhu has passed through the hearts of Muslims all these years. All these years. Even in the battle of Uhud. In the battle of Uhud when Umayyah, his, his slave master, Bilal radiallahu anhu told the Ansar, when one of the companions actually, he caught Umayyah and he was keeping him safe. He was like, this is my prisoner, you can't touch him. And then Bilal's like, you know, لا نجوتو in Naja. He's like, I will not be saved if, if Umayyah is going to be saved today. And he said, oh Ansar, remember the stories about me be, being tortured? And they said, yes, this is the guy. And so the, the Ansar, they don't know what Umayyah looked like. Bilal told, this is the guy here. And one of the companions got on top of him to protect him. He's like, no, this is my prisoner, don't touch him. And they're like, no, we're going to kill him because he touched Bilal. And they actually, they, they would spear Umayyah from underneath this companion. They didn't want to touch the companion, but they're going to kill him anyway. Umayyah, because of what he did to Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah loves you, even if someone was torturing or people hit at some point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that person, Jibreel loves that person, the angels love that person, and then Qabul is put on the earth for that person. Qabul, acceptance by the people, everybody in their heart loves this person. And this is what I wish for myself and this is what I wish for you inshallah ta'ala. One of these people that... Um, inshallah it's a good sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved him was uh, Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah. Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah, even when I said his name, even in the hearts of people, you already start feeling the emotions. When Sheikh bin Baz uh, rahimahullah, this was like fourth year university, when I was in fourth year university, that was the year Sheikh bin Baz um, passed away. And he passed away, this was like exam time. And subhanAllah, when um, he died like on a Thursday, and when I, um, I actually, I had come home, and my wife, she, came, she was at the neighbor's and she came home. When I saw in her face, when I saw in her face, the sadness that I saw, I just said, what happened? <clears throat> I said to her, I said, what happened? From what I saw in her face, she didn't even respond. And I said, that's the type of sadness when someone gets the news of their father dying. I said, I said, did your father die? And she said, no, Sheikh bin Baz died. And then, you know, like most of the people have never even seen Sheikh bin Baz. They've never seen him in his life, in their lives. I saw him once. I just saw him once, I was in Riyadh, and he gave a lecture after, and I just said, you know, I just want to see him just so I could go to Australia in 2008 and tell him that I saw Sheikh Mubaz, you know. 
And at the Jummah khutbah, obviously Sheikh bin Baz, his janazah was at the Kaaba. And the announcer, even on the radio, was crying. The Imam at the Masjid Nabawi, <laughs> we'll have to kick that guy out. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, the Imam of the Kaaba was crying. I, I prayed in Masjid uh, Qiblatain that on Friday, that Imam was crying. I don't think anybody gave the Jummah Khutbah that day that wasn't crying. There was nobody that wasn't crying. And I thought to myself, I've had family members that have died, I didn't cry for them like that. I didn't cry for my own family members. Insha'Allah. And if you see Sheikh bin Baz, you'll be like, this is Sheikh bin Baz? He's old man, he's blind, and, and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put love, the love the people had for, in the hearts of all these human beings. And inshallah ta'ala that that's a good sign, inshallah and Allah knows best, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from him. And that's giving you a glimpse of the power of doing your actions sincerely for the sake of Allah. That's what it's about. When you do something sincerely for Allah, not fearing the people and always moving forward, whether they criticize you, whether they praise you, makes no difference. That the actions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah puts qabul in the people's hearts for this person. And that wasn't their goal. Inshallah ta'ala, what I'm going to do is give you some um, specific techniques on how to gain this love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day he was playing Al-Hasan Al-Husayn radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Al-Husayn radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lifted him up and he made this statement. He said, Ahabba Allah man ahabba al-Husayn. He said, may Allah love the one who loves Al-Husayn radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so I thought, so there, right there, loving the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, loving the family members of the Prophet ﷺ, is one way to gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one way. And from this hadith, I thought to myself, what are other ways that we see from the Qur'an and Sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is how you get Allah's love. These are the people that Allah loves. How do you get those things? And so these are the things that we're going to be talking about. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he made a list of these things. In one of his books, he wrote down what a person needs to do in order that Allah loves them. Just claiming that you love of Allah, that you love Allah, is not really the big, that big a deal. The issue is, does Allah love you? And so of these, of these things that you need to focus on, number one is uh, Qiyamul Layl, praying in the night. And so when someone wakes up in the middle of the night, they're waking up for something that's not even compulsory upon them. Everybody's always complaining like, how do we wake up for Fajr? How do you wake up for Fajr? This person does it. It's not even a fard prayer. It's a voluntary prayer. And the person wakes up for Fajr, is waking up for Fajr, uh, sorry, um, waking up in the middle of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down in the third portion of the night and says, هَلْ مِنْ دَاعٍ فَأَسْتَجِيبُ لَهِ هَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرُ لَهِ Is there anyone who will make dua? and I will answer their dua. Is there anybody who will ask for forgiveness? And I will forgive them. And SubhanAllah, even like the statement like, how many people in those late hours, who's awake at that time? The whole city has died. Everybody's asleep. Maybe a few people are awake, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and everybody else is asleep. <coughs> There's just silence. And at that moment, you know, when you're, and one brother said to me, he said, you know, they studied it in med school and stuff like that. I didn't remember with med school, they teach some dumb things sometimes. <laughs> he goes that that is, at that portion of the night, you're in the deepest sleep and it's actually bad for your health to wake up at that time. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going, you know what the problem was? I go, because your teacher is a kafir. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> And he told you that this is very bad for the health to wake up at this time. SubhanAllah, that nobody wakes up at that time. Your body, that's when you're in the deepest sleep. And that's when it is the most virtuous. Everybody's sleeping at that time. When you hit like 3 o'clock, 3 a.m., 4, everybody's sleeping. And yet someone still from the deepest of sleep wakes up for the sake of Allah. And makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ نَاشِئَةَ اللَّيْلِ هِيَ أَشَدُّ وَطْءًا وَأَقْوَمُ قِيلًا 
you will understand at that moment in time when you're like three in the you know three in the morning and you wake up when you recite the Quran it's voluntary and it's something like completely different obviously some people they are very excited about Qiyam al but they don't wake up for Fajr okay first things first you wake up for Fajr first if you're all excited about Qiyam al you will come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost by doing your fard and establishing your fard. There's nothing that you can do better than establishing your fard. Once you've established your fard, then you can do things like qiyam al layl but focusing on your fard and establishing it. Secondly, is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembering Allah azza wa jal. adhkurkum. Remember me and I'll remember you. Remember me and I'll remember you. You know, it's interesting. You have people that come from, you know, people that you love very much. And you go to them and you say, do you remember me? The person's like, what's your name again? <laughs> How many people have done that before? You said that to someone. Do you remember me? And they're like, what's your name again? And, and the, what happens when, you, when they say that to you? You're like, you didn't remember me? <laughs> like, is, you don't remember who I am? No. <laughs> don't remember you. Now, how about you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How would you like for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remember you? Allah, remember me? Do you want Allah to remember you? It's very easy. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember Allah, and Allah will remember you. And, and it's just like you're looking, you want human beings to remember you, you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remember, to remember you. And, and the good, actually, this isn't good news, but. A lot of human beings don't do this. They don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you make it your habit to be amongst al-dhakirin Allah kathiran wa dhakirat those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often, male or female, they have a special place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one of the verses in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِ الشَّكُورِ where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and how few of my slaves are thankful to me. And I remember reading that verse and I said, Oh Allah, make me from the few of your slaves that are thankful to you. There's just a few of them. And it's an elite group of people that are truly thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you want to be a part of that group? You have to work for it. And you will be tested whether you're truthful. You said yes. That statement, yes, I do want to be from that group. Are you telling the truth or not? Allah will test you to see if you're telling the truth. That do you really want to be amongst those few that were thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The other way, if, if a, you have a friend and they write you a letter, they write you a letter and they say, you know, here's a letter from your friend and you know, friend you haven't seen for a long time, you open the letter, you want to read every word. If it's someone that you love very dearly, you read it again and again and again. What did they say? You know, they erased this word. What were they erasing? What did they mean? And you keep going over it again and again and again, contemplating what was said. Correct? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed His Qur'an. How many people go to those words and want to understand everything. There was one brother, uh, we were leading uh, Taraweeh, me and another brother, and the other brother would pray like um, the witter, and he would make dua, and he's crying like every night, right? And then, so, um, one of the African-American brothers in our community, he came to me, and he said, you know, he came with a pen and paper. He had reverted to Islam, and doesn't understand Arabic, and he said, I want you to translate what the Imam is saying in witter. He just caught me in the hallway. He's like, and he had the paper and pen ready. He's serious. I'm like, you're not serious, are you? Like the, you want me to translate the whole witr du'a here in the hallway? <laughs> and you got your pen and paper ready and <laughs> stuff like that, right? And then while I'm trying to figure out how to explain to him, I can't do this translation, he starts crying. And he said, because, he said, whatever the imam is saying, if we understood what he was saying, we would cry too. Understand, you see, you get that. They're all Muslims, whether you understand Arabic or not. And whether an Arab person is crying or not, it's just, this is the language. If you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll want to understand what Allah is saying. Nobody says, I love Allah, but I'm not going to listen to what he says. I'm going to abandon the Quran, but I love Allah. 
If you loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to spend more and more time reading the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Won't they contemplate the verses? Won't they contemplate the Qur'an? In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ a book we reveal down to you, blessed, so that its verses will be contemplated. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, not for something to be put up on a shelf and abandoned, but rather that the Quran would be brought down and the people would recite it and contemplate it, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so I'm going to be giving you a break, but before we go to break, we have some. Bismillah. Um, we were talking about, um, before we took the break, we were speaking about the uh, recitation of the Qur'an and contemplating the recitation of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those who revealed the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَتْلُونَهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they recite it with the true recitation, حَقُّ tilawa. And so what I want to tell you here is, what the scholars mention is haqq tilawa because these are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ulaika yu'minu like they're the only ones who believe truly in the Quran are those who recite it with haqq tilawa haqq tilawa is three things number one is reciting the Quran reciting the Quran with um, proper tajweed so haqq tilawa is reciting with the Quran with proper tajweed number two is Reciting the Qur'an with tadabbur, contemplation. So reciting it, trying your best, learning tajweed to recite properly and so on and so forth. Secondly, after that is to recite it with contemplation. The person is trying to understand what's being said and think about the verses and so on. And then the third one is implementation. It's where the person, after they've contemplated something and they realize what the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, they now move on to implement what they've recited. This is um, Haqq Tilawa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, about um, the, the seven sleepers, or the, the, um, the sleepers of the cave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ How many times did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the dog? There are three times. Now this is a dog. This is a dog, and there's many dogs. When you see a dog, what do you do? What do Muslims do when they see a dog? They run. And they're not... <laughs> they run, and they, you know, the non-Muslims are like, what's wrong with you? It's just, a, you, know, you, know, you know, there's a little dog, and you know, your child will go to the dog, and you'll get so scared, and they're like, it's okay, they can lick and so on and so forth. You run away from the dogs. The dog, and if, you need, if, if I said, you know, dog, you know, in Arabic they say, Akramakumullah. It's even like, you know, you're even, um, it's like dishonoring your guest by mentioning a dog. And yet this dog has special status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This dog is mentioned in the Quran three times. Actually more than three times. Because even in there's another verse that is, the dog is mentioned. Now, what did this dog do to get such special status? You want to study the secrets of this dog. This dog could write a book on the success secrets of how to get mentioned in the Quran. How to get into the Quran. Well, it's the, do the dog's got just one secret. He's like, hang around with really cool people. <laughs> end of the story. The end. This is the dog's secret. Hang around with people that Allah loves. And Allah will love you. And so our, what we're seeking out, when you, in your community, there are people that have very good character that you know. Everyone you think good character, everybody says, you know, this guy, everybody knows they have good character. You be extra, uh, put in extra effort to be the friend of this person. Extra effort. They're like, you know what, um, you know, I want, to, I want your good character to rub off on me. So I want to be with you. There was this um, brother once, I was actually in, in Jordan, and there was an Iraqi brother who was like a refugee there, and he was selling um, itr, selling perfume outside the masjid. 
And this brother, you know, after Salah, he's sitting there selling perfumes and so on. And so we were just traveling, so we would sit and, and, uh, and sit with the brother. After he would fill up a bottle of perfume, and even actually the security guards of the masjid, it's a big masjid in downtown, um, in town, downtown Amman. Uh, they let him sell just because they knew this brother like he had no money and he's, and he's very much in need. They wouldn't let anybody else sell, they let him sell. He's, he had no other means of, of um, income and he's a refugee and so on. And this brother, after he'd fill up a bottle and he'd have this uh, syringe, right? He'd fill up the bottle and then he has to um, so, uh, pull up a different uh, flavor of perfume. So what he would do is he has to completely empty the syringe so that the, uh, the smells don't misk. How do you think he empties it? He's like, brother, come here, I need to empty the syringe. So he'd go, he would blow it out all onto our clothes. And then someone else would come and buy and he has to empty it out, so he'd blow it out. He doesn't want to just blow it into the air. <clears throat> and then even in the end, we didn't necessarily buy anything from him, but you couldn't get the smell off your clothes for like a couple of days. And I thought to myself, the Prophet ﷺ said, Method al jalisu salih wa jalisu su, that the example of a good person that you sit with, right? Like a friend that you're always sitting with and a bad friend that you're always sitting with is like the person who carry the bearer of musk and the, um, the, 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 like the person who plays with fire. <clears throat> and I'm giving you this example. If you hang around with someone who sells perfumes, there's no doubt, you don't even have to buy anything. Just being in their present, you will smell good. And if you hang around with people who deal with fire, hellfire in this case, <laughs> then you'll start to stink. They will say words, let's say you hang around with people, they're always using swear words. You occasionally will start to pick this up. You know, like the per you'll be hanging around, if you put someone, take them into a trash can, right, like public school or something like that. You take them and you put them in the trash can every single day. They're going trash can, trash can, trash can, trash can. Then they come home with boyfriend, girlfriend. They come home doing haram things and you're like, son, you stink. Okay, wait a second here. Oh, parent, didn't you put your son in the trash bin like for the la all these years? You've been dumping them in trash bin and now you're saying, why do you smell bad? This is the example and so you have to be very critical, very critical you can't choose your family members, that's been already decided for you, but you can choose your friends. You have to take extra effort to find those people that are seeking the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People that when you start backbiting, they're like, brother, just keep quiet. We don't talk like this in our gatherings. People that will remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's Salah time and they're saying, let's go and pray. They're the ones who are encouraging you. And that's how you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by being in the companionship of people like that. <clears throat> like I said, it's an effort that you have to put into to seek those people out and be in their companionship. <clears throat> Loving the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is a way to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful story. Uh, there's a companion um, who there was a woman, a female companion that he loved a lot and he wanted to marry. And he was always like chasing her around trying to get her to marry him. And I know you'd like stories like that, right? <laughs> he was going around, Barira. And, and he was going around trying to get her love, trying to get her to marry him. She's like, no, I don't want to marry you. No, I, you know, I don't want, you know, she's just turning him off all the time. He's like, please, please. And she's like, no, leave me alone and so on and so forth. And so he went to the Prophet and ask the Prophet ﷺ, you know, give me a recommendation, you know, for her. Like, give me like a letter of, uh, um, what are those things called? We call it tazkiyah. What do you call it? Not approval. Can you write what? Character reference? That's what you call it? A testimonial. Something like that. Like, give me a testimonial. Give me a testimonial for this woman so that she likes. So the Prophet ﷺ had this testimonial for this companion and and she still disregarded him. So you know, so this companion, he said, she disregarded the, the testimonial of the Prophet He's like, I'll never love her again. Like she just dropped in my eyesight. Like all that love, it was snuffed out. It's finished. You're done. Even though he wanted to marry her so badly, because she did that, nobody does that to the Messenger of Allah. 
And so, and after when he did this, then she fell in love with him. And he was like, I'll never. That's it. This is how much they love the Prophet And again, the focus here is on the love for the Prophet قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ If you claiming that you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِ Then follow me, follow the Messenger Follow the Sunnah of the Prophet يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Allah will love you. And so the true path, if someone says, I truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you'd follow the Sunnah of the Prophet If someone's not following the Sunnah and they say, we love Allah and His Messenger, you're lying. It is an absolute lie. You cannot possibly claim to love Allah and, and still not follow the Sunnah of the Prophet They are a contradiction. The person has lied if they're not following the Sunnah of the Prophet If someone loves the Prophet they would do the Sunnah of the Prophet So that's one of the ways. Being patient. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Inna Allaha ma'asabirin." Verily, Allah is with those who are patient. Or you see other verses, right? In Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu mutatahirin. Other things like that. Those who repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, those who purify themselves, and so on. And the issue of sabr. We were speaking in the other lecture about how this issue of sabr is just an academic thing for most people. They hear about sabr, but when the actual tests come upon them, they're not patient. And so sabr happens at the first moment of the, you know, the calamity or the news or something like that. It's your unconscious, it's your unconscious reaction to things. A lot of people, they're, um, when something hits them, the first thing that they say when they get hit, let's say your car just got hit. It went boom, someone hit the back of your car. What's the first thing that you say? Yeah, you can't even say it out loud, that's why. We're talking real life here. We're not talking about what the ideal situation would be. Someone hits your car, you immediately swear. Correct? Immediate swear. What the? <laughs> That's interesting. But, you know, in the, in the Arabic language, when you're angry at someone, when you're angry at someone, you say, Ittaqillah. Ittaqillah. You know, have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> this is when you're angry at someone. It's like an insult even to when people are saying that to each other. They're in the middle of a fight and the other guys know, you ittaqillah. <laughs> and, then, and, and then you compare that, you know, in, in Arabic you're saying, Assalamu alaikum. It's like a contract of peace between me and you. Every time you're shaking someone's hand, may peace be upon you. It's like, I, I come to you in peace. And the other person's like, I come to you in peace and with the mercy of Allah as well. May you have peace and the mercy of Allah. Then when you're speaking in English, what do you say to the people? Sup. <laughs> Even the word hello, what does it mean? We say it all the time, but we have no idea what it means. It's a salutation. That means nothing. It's just salutation. Hello. <laughs> you know? So to be patient, in Allah ma'asabirin. You want to get to the zone where you're unconsciously, the first reaction that you get, you're hit and you're like, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There was this, um, this uh, Saudi Airlines flight flew over India and there was an in-air collision. You guys remember that? The in-air collision, I mean two airplanes came in, the person heard you know, the altitude incorrectly, they were coming at a direct, and it's all dark and they couldn't see anything, it's very cloudy. These two airplanes collided in air. Right? So Boeing and then this other airplane, I believe it was like a Russian airplane or so on, they collided in air. The Saudi airline flight, a Boeing, right, a jumbo jet, turned upside down and then fell to the ground. Everybody was killed on that, on that airplane. Everybody. It was like the largest uh, um, crash that ever happened. The pilot of the, of the airplane, the black box, and they're like listening to the recordings, he saw the airplane come out of the clouds for about like half a second before it actually hit his airplane. It just came out of the clouds, he saw it for half a second, and then it hit the airplane and then the black box cuts off after that. You know what he said in that half second? He saw the airplane, he saw death coming to everybody on the airplane and he said, La ilaha, it, it cut off. In that, in that split second, you're talking about like the blink of an eye. You don't have time to process. Remember we were talking about the hand pulling back? 
it overrides and you just go from the heart. And even, even the sentence is too long for that, how split, how, how little that time was. He said, La, and then it, and it sh the recording shuts off from the collision that happened at that point. Now, how do you get to the zone where you're coming from the heart that quickly? And that is when someone is truly patient. You will consistently try to be patient, try to be patient. Allah will test you, you'll go through events until this thing becomes part of who you are. When you get hit by a car, something happens, it comes from your heart, it's not coming from your head. You're saying, La ilaha illa Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. If I said to you, Do you like Bob? How many people like him? Yeah. Who else? Who else likes Bob? <laughs> Who is Bob? <laughs> Who is Bob? So what you just experienced right there is the inability to come to a conclusion about someone that you don't know their name and you don't know their characteristics. You don't know their asma and you don't know their sifat. You can't come to a conclusion. You don't know their name, you don't know their character. How can you come to a conclusion about love for the Prophet when you don't know the Messenger of Allah how can you come to a conclusion and build your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't know jack about what the Qur'an has revealed or what the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are or the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just experienced this, this guy named Bob and if I started going into detail, oh this Bob and with this characteristic, this person you may, and then you can come to a conclusion whether you like him or not. One of the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم that no drowsiness takes on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor does he sleep. And I think to myself, you're praying Qiyamul Layl. You want to wake up for Qiyamul Layl. One of the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he doesn't sleep. And he never becomes drowsy. And you're thinking as you're trying to wake up, Allah's already awake waiting for you. And patiently too. It's been a lot of years that you haven't prayed Qiyam. How many nights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been awake saying, who will make dua for me? And you were snoring right through the whole thing. <laughs> and you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching it. Imagine you're just sitting there in your bedroom. It's late at night. You're half awake. Alarm goes off. 2.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock. And Allah is waiting patiently for you to wake up. And then shaitan tells you, it's still, you got lots of time left. It's a very quiet moment, correct? لا تأخذوا سنة ولا نوم السميع البصير When, um, uh, this is a beautiful thing that I, uh, analogy that I have for God consciousness. Taqwa. And it says, all these verses that speak about taqwa and so on. And a lot of people, you hear it mentioned a lot, a lot of people don't understand what taqwa is. I have this beautiful analogy, it's so amazing. No one will ever tell you this one because I made it up. Okay? All right, so you're sitting and you're having fun, you're enjoying the lecture and so on and so forth, and you're just casually looking and so on, and you look to the side and you realize that there's a camera right there. Did you guys notice that there's a camera right there? Can everybody wave to the camera over there? Do you think that there's people watching you from that camera? This is being broadcasted on other, on other levels. There are cameras watching. And then now that you pay now that you notice that, you notice there's another camera looking right there. Did you notice that? And everybody upstairs is like, we can see you guys. <laughs> they were watching the whole time even when you didn't realize that there was a camera there. You just became conscious of it. You just became conscious. But they were watching the whole time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa lillahi al al-a'la is al-basir. He was watching you the whole time. Whether you're sleeping or whether you're awake, whether you're conscious of it or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. And there's these moments where all of a sudden something snaps in your mind, you realize this whole time we've been watched. And that's correct. And it's interesting, a lot of people, when you, if I told you for example, oh you know what, the secret service, it, secret service has actually bugged you, I have full information that there's a secret service, it's bugged you. Everything that you've been saying on your phone and your email, all of that is being recorded. And it is actually, and you know this. And then you're all freaking out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has His agents. An angel on the right, an angel on the left. 
They have always been with you even when you forgot that you were being watched. And they wrote everything down. Everything that you said, every time your mouth opened, they wrote those things down. If you did Tawbah, it's erased. If you didn't do Tawbah, it's still recorded there. Waiting for you to repent. Everything has been written down. This is taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when you remember Allah, what you're actually doing is realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. When you have the taqwa of Allah, taqwa, if you're about to, let's say, about to do something haram. Here's a glass of uh, wine, and you're about to drink it. Before you drink it, you realize, you look at it, you're like, I'm being watched. And you have this taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is watching me. I can't drink this. And you have shame. How can I disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And you pull it back. Right? That's what taqwa is about. Doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded, staying away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade, being conscious that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you in these commandments of Allah azza wa jal. And once someone gets to that zone, I remember once, subhanAllah, there was, you know, you're at home and you're making jokes and so on and so forth. There is this um, family that lives in Ottawa. And they're, they're the type of family, they're like the sweetest, like, like some of the nicest Muslims that you've ever seen. And then I, I remember I was just joking with my wife and I said something about them. And she said, watch it. Those people are righteous people. Allah will destroy you <laughs> if you say anything bad about them. And I said, I said, well, Allah, you're right. And, I, and I'm like, I'm doing tough because they're such good people, you can't touch them. It's a, and when a person, this, this wilaya, the, is the friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, some, when someone gets to that zone to become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you need to do is have iman and amal salih. Ala inna awliya, uh, awliya Allah ila khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there's no fear upon his walis, his friends. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. No fear and they'll never be grieved, never be sad. Alladheena amanu wa kanu yattaqoon. Those who had iman and they had the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were conscious of Allah azza wa jal and they were believers. This takes the person into the wilaya, the friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the path to gaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. The nawafil, the, um, these voluntary acts the person does. You have the fard, and like I said, you have to focus first and foremost on the fard. There's nothing that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala faster than focusing on the fard. You have to focus on it, the compulsory things, your five prayers, your um, zakah, your uh, fasting in Ramadan, performing hajj, and so on and so forth. You focus on the fard and establish those. This is the, the best thing that you can do to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, come the voluntary actions. So someone is praying dhuhr. And a lot of people actually, in our day and age, because it's like busy lifestyle and so on, everybody just focuses on praying their dhuhr. Praying four rak'ahs, hopefully before asr time comes in, and then they're good. Is that establishing prayer? Establishing salah is going to the masjid. Praying your sunnah before the dhuhr. Praying your sunnah after, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, paying attention in your prayer. Iqamatu salah, which is establishing the salah. After the establishment of salah, and then you put in all these voluntary actions, that it's not fard for you to do it, but you're doing it out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, that Allah said, that the, my servant will continue to try to come closer to me with these voluntary deeds, this nawafil, until I love that slave. So the person is doing these voluntary deeds saying, Oh Allah, love me, I will do more. You'll see in the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an. That Allah is pleased with them. And they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even that statement when you say, Companion, radiyallahu an. May Allah be pleased with him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran that he was pleased with them. It's a dua. All right, in conclusion, in coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to know, does Allah love me or not? When will you find out? When you're dead. That's when you truly find out. Now, if you're wrong, then you're in big trouble. <laughs> so how can you find out in advance and measure yourself before you die so that if they need something to be corrected, you can correct it on the way, inshallah ta'ala. Firstly, you're measuring yourself up with the fard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. 
right? Measure yourself up with that. How are your prayers? How is your fasting? How is your zakah? How is your love to go hajj? How is your tawheed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sincerity and all of these things and following the sunnah of the Prophet Measure yourself up against that. If you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a consistent basis, you might be deluding yourself to thinking, oh Allah loves me so much, I'm, you know, I'm going straight to Jannah. Jannah to Firdaus, I'm going there, right? <clears throat> Jannah al Firdaus is a special place. Highest level of Jannah, if you're aiming for it, you're aiming with action. You're not aiming just in Tamenni, which is, I wish. Instead, you're saying, I'm working for this. Okay? Another way to measure it, whether <coughs> action is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good deeds follow up good deeds. So if you did a good deed, for example, let's say you came to this lecture, which is a blessed deed that you did. You came to lecture hoping to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to learn something so that you can feel this iman and so on. And now after the lecture, you go to a pub and drink alcohol. <laughs> Let's just imagine that that happened. <coughs> now is that a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this deed from you? Or is that a sign that you're almost like being pushed away? Now imagine something else, someone came to this lecture and maybe before they weren't doing their salah and after this lecture you know they loved it so much, at Fajr time they woke up for Fajr prayer. They haven't woken up for Fajr prayer for a long time. And now they woke up for Fajr prayer. This is a good sign that inshallah ta'ala Allah accepted from you, you coming here. And so on. Does that mean that you will, after doing the good deed, you will forever do good deeds till the day you die? Obviously not. Human beings make mistakes. But here's the thing how you can, um, I call it like a, a stop loss. Do you guys know what stop loss is? How many people know what a stop loss is? Okay, nobody knows. It's an analogy that nobody will understand. <laughs> a stop loss is when you... Um, uh, I'm not even going to explain it. When you're doing a bad deed, a way to stop it is to do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quickly. Right? So when you're on a decline, don't delay your tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's suppose someone missed Fajr, and they're like, Oh, I got till Dhuhr to pray Fajr now. If I just wait five minutes and miss it, now Allah just gave me a gift of an extra five hours before Dhuhr. Do you really think it was a gift to you? You still have that time? They're like, oh, it's okay, pray any time before Dhuhr. If you missed Fajr prayer by two minutes, you get up right then and there. You get up right then and there, not five minutes later. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overtakes the person, and they go make wudu and they pray at that time. You don't have till Dhuhr time to pray. The Prophet wasallam said, um, whoever sleeps through a prayer or forgets a prayer should pray it when they remember that prayer. And now this person actually disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in missing the prayer. It's not that they forgot it, they consciously just kept pressing the snooze button so many times until they missed it. And so the person hastens in their tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you did that, you hasten in your tawbah to Allah, hasten in repentance, then your good deeds will start to increase in their potential, inshallah ta'ala, and their um, focus. Wallahu ta'ala alam. And I'll tell you uh, another way is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has angels. They do different things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated angels that when you make dua for your brother in his absence, the angel says, may the same be for you. So, what you do, inshallah ta'ala, is you raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you say, Oh Allah, love Muhammad al-Sharif. <laughs> you can do that now if you want. <laughs> and then the angel says, Ameen, and may the same be for you. So this is like guaranteed you get the dua. The angel is like, you're making dua and the angel is saying, Ameen. Same for you. Ameen. Same for you. Ameen. Same for you. Whatever you want in your life, just find people that you can make du'a for them. So, oh Allah, I want to get married. Oh Allah, marry such and such a person. <coughs> and the angel says, Ameen, and may the same be for you. And having a culture of making du'a of the good and blessed things that you wish for yourself, find people who need these things and make du'a for them. You don't have to go around telling them, hey, I made du'a for you. <laughs> in their absence, inshallah ta'ala. Allah ta'ala alam. All right, so we'll answer some questions. Okay, so it says, um, you mentioned that Allah only tests those that He loves. Does that mean that He doesn't test those He hates? If someone who, dis is, who is disobedient to Allah and goes through a horrible calamity, does that mean Allah loves that person? Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests everybody. And uh, I don't know if I said that Allah only tests those He loves. 
Did I say that? I kind of said it? Okay, I apologize if that understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests everybody. Problem is those he doesn't love, they fail the tests. And it's not that difficult. They're just like, they failed it. Now they're in like detention. <laughs> right? So the tests, actually their tests become dunya stuff. So it's like they failed their tests. Now they got like some big job. Now they got, you know, like interesting if you see a Muslim person, um, if you find that, oh, they're growing their beard and they're coming to the masjid and they're wearing good, nice Islamic clothes and so on and so on. And you see this, you're like, subhanAllah, you lost your job, brother, didn't you? <laughs> and they're like, yes, they're crying. They're, maybe they're spending extra time in the masjid reading Quran and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, snap, they're gone. What happened to them? Next time you see them, it's six weeks later, clean shaven, wearing a suit, praying at the back for Juma prayer. The guy came late for Juma. What happened, brother? Allah has opened his doors of provision upon me. Allah has blessed me with the job and blessed me with wealth. That's why I can't worship him the way I was worshiping him before. Okay? So now, in both situations, was the person being tested? The answer is yes. Right? They're both being tested. But when someone's not sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like Allah abandons the person. Here, take it. This is the dunya you want. They get more rope to hang themselves with. And so, if you, uh, one of the companions عنه, said, if you have good things happening to you, and you didn't do any extra good deeds to get these things happening to you, then beware. Because you're being set up. Like it's like, oh, you know what? I didn't do anything good. I've been missing all my prayers. All of a sudden, I got this great job, pays $150,000 every year. Like, I didn't do anything to deserve this. You're being set up. It might be actually a consequences of your sins. That you're getting the dunya, and even some of the companions, one of the companions, he got this huge amount of wealth, and he was so scared. We need to take that phone, man. <laughs> That's the same phone. <laughs> Muslim is never bitten from the same snake hole twice. You've been bitten three times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> what was I saying? What's that? Okay, yeah. So he had a lot of wealth coming to him, and then and his wife, she saw him, he was so scared, and he said, you know, you know, something horrible has happened. And she said, has the Khalifa died? And he said, something worse. What actually happened was, the Khalifa had sent him money. That's what he was so scared about. That it was a fitna from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the question the sister is saying is that I'm, I'm a convert to Islam. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I'm trying very hard to seek knowledge, learn Quran, increase my level of ibadah. But because I don't understand Arabic, it's very hard to feel close to Allah when I'm, in, when I'm praying or making dua. For example, words like majesty mean nothing because these words are used so loose, loosely in English. Her majesty, the queen, for example. What can I do to increase my love and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay. Um, Jazakallah khayyam for saying this. I agree with you. A lot of the English words that we're taught, sometimes in order to understand English, I have to read it in Arabic. Even though English is my first language. Even English grammar, who understands what an adjective is? <laughs> right? And then, when I was teaching this to Arab kids, I learned the Arabic of what adjective means. And I only understood what adjective is because of the Arabic explanation of it. Because the Arabic was so clear. And so a lot of the English words, like, I'll give you an example, subhanAllah. What does it mean? It's that glory be to Allah. What does glory be to Allah mean? What does that mean? In, even in English, it means nothing. Glory be to Allah. And so the whole energy of that statement, subhanAllah, is just gone. Because we don't understand what these words mean. And I love to actually change these words, instead of say, uh, saying it words that you would understand better. So that when you say subhanAllah, you have a better understanding of what subhanAllah means. A better translation that I find is a statement like subhanAllah that um, how far, it's like a rhetorical question, how far Allah is from imperfection. Subhanallah. How far Allah is from imperfection. So someone says Allah has a son. Subhanallah. How far Allah is from the imperfection that you're associating to Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yasifun. Right? And that's a lot more stronger for me than saying glory be to Allah. 
right? Which is like common translation. So seek out other translations. So someone tells you this word means this. Say, um, can you give me some other ways of explaining this? How else? And sometimes the person who's translating, they themselves might not even know what the word means, right? So you look in tafsir and you find things out and so on. Even like the word taqwa. I gave you an example about, uh, about the, uh, the cameras. Guaranteed no one has ever told you that before, right? But you understood it because it's something that you understand very clearly. Now someone will start giving them a God consciousness, fear of Allah and so on. And then when you hear taqwa, you have no idea what it's talking about. But now inshallah ta'ala you have a better, you want to seek out things like that, understanding what these words mean, inshallah ta'ala, and it'll come closer. And the advice that I would give you, you're doing excellent in seeking knowledge and so on, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and saying, oh Allah, increase me and help me find ways so that I would increase my love of you, oh Allah. Okay, it says, I have a lot of health problems that are ongoing that will be uh, for life. I often get upset and teary about them and see others healthier than me and feel very overwhelmed. I never say, why me? But I wonder if I have failed the test Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting in front of me. Okay, so the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, guess what? You're not the only one being tested. Right? So you might have health problems. Someone else lost a child. Someone else... This happened to them. Everybody has problems. One of the beautiful things that I love to do is when someone tells me their problem in like a public gathering, I'm like, who else has this problem? And the whole audience raised their hand. I'm like, guess what? You're not the only one. <laughs> you tell me your problem and I'll show you that the majority of people here have the same problem. And they're like, no, I'm special. <laughs> I'm the only one Allah has tested. <laughs> it's not true. We all got the same test. Everybody's being tested. We just fluctuate in... Um, in our reaction to those tests. Even the Prophet is tested and we said, he said, may the mercy of Allah be upon my brother Musa. He was tested with more than this and he was patient. Now the question is, um, I don't say why me, but I wonder if I failed the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever you have, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, whatever test that you have, I remember once there was a brother, he was, um, he needed an operation, there was a fundraiser just to pay for his operation, something like 30,000 or something like that. In this, and I was, I was speaking, a group of people had gathered together so they could raise funds. It was so sweet, this gathering, because it was a fundraiser just for one person. Just to help him pay for his medical bills and so on. And I was so honored to be invited to this. And I said, What's, what a blessed group of people that organized this for this brother. And I said, guess what? He's being tested. And he knows he's being tested. And so he's being patient. But all of us are being tested as well, but we don't recognize it. So he's the lucky one. He's the one, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a gift to recognize his test and to be patient for it. Now, as the sister said, now what if you were given the chance to, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you, you know, you're going to die, you're going to die. Are you going to die? Okay, so you know, right? <laughs> you're going to die, but you're specifically going to die within these next three weeks. At the end of the month, you're dead. Here's a guarantee. Here's, here's the ticket. Would that make you happy or make you sad? Knowing that you have a last chance. Would it make you happy or make you sad? Would it make you happy? You're told when you're going to die. Would it make you sad? You're going to die anyway. So even the people that weren't given the ticket, you were actually blessed that you were told. Other people weren't told. It's called cancer. Right? So now who gets cancer and they're so happy? In fact, it's an opportunity. They're like, the person now realizes I'm going to die. Guess what? You were going to die before you got the cancer. It's just now someone reminded you that you're going to die. That's just the difference. And the other people, they're going to die anyway, but they're like, oh, subhanAllah, this person has cancer, they're going to die. <laughs> We're going to die too. It's just that they've recognized the test, and we haven't. Correct? So if he, a person has health problems, it's going to be for life and so on and so forth. It's an opportunity to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you comprehend and take advantage of it. And if you're not going to get better, then what's the point in not being patient? Then you get no benefit from the sickness. 
at least extract all the benefits you can possibly get from the sickness. Like this sickness is awesome. Because it's been reminding me every single day to be patient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I get the opportunity to be patient. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith Qudsi that if someone loses their eyesight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angel, like, how did the person, you know, how did they react? They were patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces because of their eyesight, their two beloved things, your eyesight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces them with Jannah because of their patience in that. Right? If a person has a child die and their child dies and they're patient, Prophet ﷺ said if a woman loses three children, um, um, she'll go to Jannah. What if they lose two children, even two children, right? Actually, this was uh, um, not losing it, but having, uh, giving birth to girls. Giving birth to girls. If someone is blessed with three girls and they raise them and take care of them, they'll have Jannah. Because normally the Arab people were like, if they had girls, they wouldn't be happy to have girls. It was a huge test for them. And they would kill their baby girls because of that. It's like such a huge test for them to have a girl. And yet, the reward is if a person has three girls and they take care of them, they'll go to Jannah. What about two girls? They said, Ya Rasulullah and Prophet even two girls. And they said, if we asked him about one girl, he would have said, even one girl. So if you have one girl, you're blessed, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so they're just opportunities. How do you differentiate between a test and a punishment? Great question. How do you know if it's a test or a punishment? It depends on how you react to it. <coughs> if you react in a horrible way, then it was a punishment. If you react in a way that makes you come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're all tests, but it becomes a way of mercy. Allah is testing you so that you come closer. So let's say, for example, tsunami in Indonesia, right? Tsunami in Indonesia, is it a test or is it a punishment? It depends on how the people react to it. Uh, there was one brother, I met him in Hajj, and this was like, because um, it happened in like December, and Hajj was soon after that, and I was like, I saw some Indonesian people, and they said, Alhamdulillah, we came early for Hajj. And they missed the tsunami completely. They were in Mecca when the tsunami happened. And I asked him about this, and I said, you know, how are the people reacting, and so on. He said, everybody is reminding each other that this is something, uh, a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have to return to Allah azza wa jalla. We have to do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you talk to non-Muslims, they're like, how dare you say it was from God? <laughs> you know, these crazy people. <laughs> and, and they just have that like, words. It's like, Mother Nature did it. <laughs> right? And if they could blame it on the Muslims, they would blame it too. The Muslims did it. Right? Nobody takes lesson. If you take lesson from it, then it is a, it's a test that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you react in a bad way, and you're like, why did this happen to me? And th then it's a punishment. It's like you suffer that and you got no benefit from it as well. <laughs> okay. It's interesting. I'm trying to contemplate the response. Assalamu alaikum. Um, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, I try to obey Allah, but only with my husband I lose my temper. <laughs> So this is one of the examples that I'd ask the sisters, how many sisters are married? Yes, how many of you lose your temper with your husband? And they all raise their hands. So you're not the only one, sister. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so this is when I ask Allah to help me not to lose my temper with my husband. Why is Allah not answering my dua? Yeah, this, is, um, this is the point here. Why is Allah not answering my dua? Does that mean that Allah doesn't love me? Okay, here's the thing. One thing, your du'a will be answered so long as you don't say, I made du'a and Allah never answered my du'a. The Prophet ﷺ said, all your du'as will be answered so long as you don't get to the point where you say, why was my du'a not answered? Okay, so that's number one. Number two is that if you make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you follow it up with actions. So one of the companions, عنه, he had a camel, and you know, it's like parking a car. You go and you park the car. Does anybody leave the keys in the car, open the doors, and say, and just go and, and leave for two hours? Does anybody do that? But what if they place their trust in Allah? Couldn't they leave their car open with the keys in the ignition and say, I've placed my trust in Allah? You'd say, no, you haven't understood what placing your trust in Allah means. What placing your trust in Allah means is closing the doors, locking the doors, putting one of those crowbars on the, <laughs> on the steering wheel and parking in a safe, lit place 
and having a GPS system, if anybody steals it, you can still find them, and then saying, I've placed my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? That, and so when someone makes dua, they tie their camel, and then they place their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now this sister, even if, if you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by getting angry like that, Prophet ﷺ said, لا تغضب, and you're treating everybody good, the person that you treat the worst out of all human beings is your husband. Yeah, you're laughing, brother. <laughs> but at the same time, there's nobody on earth that you show uh, your love to and, and like your husband. So it's like, it's a love-hate relationship type of thing, all right? And so what you consistently need to do is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never lose hope in your dua. Intensify your dua. Every if you get angry with your husband, realize that that was your choice. You chose to be angry, right? Oh, my husband made me mad. No, you chose to be angry. Because you could have been patient in those things. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, this is a time, this is kind of like not related to the question, but it says about Zakariya alayhi salam. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless him with a child. Fastajabna lahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we accepted. Uh, Allah answered his dua, bless him with a child, wa aslahna lahu zawja. And we um, aslahna, you can say like we, um, it's a word for aslahna, made, like, made righteous, and we, we made righteous his wife for him. So a lot of brothers are like, I want a righteous wife. How do you get a righteous wife? By acting like Zakariya alayhi salam. This is how you get that type of woman. And it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so for the men, this is a, you know, your wife's not treating you good stuff, Increase your ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the companions, radiallahu anhu, if he did something haram, you know, he, um, one companion, he did something haram, and you know, he touched like a woman or so on, and then he came back, and his wife said to him, some man touched me in the marketplace. He said, subhanallah. If he did this action, and his wife, you know, this happened to him as well. And so a person just doesn't blame the other person. You ask yourself, what sins have I done that have caused my dua to not be answered? Or what sins have I done and not repented to and I just think Allah is going to just keep giving me? The kuffar of Mecca, they ref refused the Prophet ﷺ and rejected. And, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ يَطْمَعُ أَنْ azid." They rejected the Prophet ﷺ and yet they still want Allah to give them more wealth and more children and more, you know, uh, all of these things from the dunya. They're still hoping for it. After all that they did, they still want more. And so again, the person looks, if they're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and dua is not being answered, check your deeds and see, am I preparing myself to accept this and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer my dua. Last like two more questions and we'll be done, inshaAllah ta'ala. <clears throat> okay, this question is, um, Trying to contemplate the answer. <laughs> it says, um, I'm 60 years old. I did Qiyamul Layl since my teenage years, but lately I'm finding it difficult. What should I do? Please give suggestions. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. There's actually uh, good news. A hadith of the Prophet وسلم, said, Man shaba shaybatan fil Islam kanat lahu nurun yawm al Qiyamah. That whoever grows old in Islam, you know, Shaiba is like white hair. And I actually I have a patch of white hair. Can you see it? <laughs> Can you see it? Okay. It's my Shaiba. Whoever gets their, their white hair, on the day of resurrection, that white hair will be nur for them. On the day of resurrection. That all these years they've been worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually this is something very blessed. Someone 60 years old and they've been doing Qiyam their whole life. Since their teenage years. 
Now in the old age, now a person might be, you know, they might be sleeping more, they're getting weaker, and so on and so forth. Allah Alam, the best deeds are those that were consistent. As the Prophet said, this person, inshallah ta'ala, they've been doing Qiyam layl consistently. Now in the old age, we know something like fasting. A person, they've been fasting all their life, and in their old age, they're not able to fast anymore. And so they feed because, you know, they feed people instead of the fasting because they're not able to. It's natural. Right? That a person gets into their old age and they don't have the same strength they had before. Right? So it's not necessarily that the person, it might be that there's sins and that's causing the person to not do the, the good deeds anymore. If that's the case, obviously you're doing tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but realize that that's the natural cycle of a human being. And so you might want to replace those good deeds with something else. So the Prophet sallallahu for example, something that comes to mind is if he missed his qiyam, he would pray those prayers in, in the daytime. So if he missed praying Witter, for example, he would always pray Witter. And if he slept through Witter, the Prophet ﷺ, like after you know, um, the sun would rise, he would pray. If he's praying Witter three rakahs, in the morning he would pray Witter four, uh, he would make it up praying four rakahs. Like not making it Witter, you're not praying two Witters in one day, he would pray four rakahs. So let's say you pray Qiyam normally, um, uh, let's say you pray nine rakahs or eleven rakahs or something like that, and now you're not able to pray it as much in the morning time, you can replace it with uh, Salat al-Duha, for example. Right? You're still making up. You might not have the same strength as before, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah accept. Okay, it says, As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as -salam. Allah says that He loves the youth who ask Allah for forgiveness. Allah loves anybody who asks for forgiveness. Okay, so it's not specific to youth, it's anybody. If this youth keeps, and, and specifically with youth we were talking about in the previous lecture about if a youth grows up in the worship of Allah, um, they get a special status, right? The shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection. Um, if this youth keeps going back to the sin and then repeats again and so on, is he also loved by Allah? How can someone overcome this repeating sin? Okay, the issue of repetition of sin. So a person, they commit a sin and then they repent to Allah and then after that they go back to the sin, they repent to Allah. Um, my advice number one is never ever give up on repenting to Allah no matter how many times you go back to the sin. So if you went back to the sin a million times, you're repenting to Allah a million one times. You never ever say, oh I'm a hypocrite, how could I be committing all the sin and repenting? My repentance must be a lie, so let me stop repenting. What's that going to do? It's, you're going to be stuck with the sin. So you never lose hope in the sin. Uh, so never lose hope in the um, asking for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, it is possible, some people say, oh, I can never give up this sin. There were sins that people have done and we've done when we were younger. And then a time comes where you completely abandon it. Like even if you think about this sin, you're like, I could never do anything like that. Even though when you were younger, you may have thought that I, I'll be doing this sin for my whole life. And then there are time comes where things snap and like, for example, toys. When you're a little kid, you, you couldn't resist toys, right? Some of you are still like that. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, uh, when I was younger, and if we went to a store, immediately I'd, see, I'd tell my mom, like, see you later, I'm going to the toy section. Right? Anybody still like that? You immediately go to the toy section? You guys over here? Yeah? Okay. And then the other time comes where, like, you know what? I don't even want to come anywhere near the toy section. Even I tried playing video games. This is me playing video games. I start playing video games, and I'm like, What's the point of this? I thought to myself, at the end of this, what will I get? I'll get like the screen saying congratulations. <laughs> I said, what a waste of time. I'm like, I don't have time for this. Even though you know, you're watching a TV show and the drama is beginning. And they're like, who killed this person? I'm like, you're acting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who faked, killed this person, and I'm not going to spend my life trying to figure this out. <laughs> Shut the TV off. It's just a waste of time, right? So what I'm saying is that there are things that you did excessively at a younger stage, and something happened, and you came a later, later port in your life, and you don't care about it anymore. The same can be for your sins. The same can be for your sins, that there will be a time where you loved it so much and then things change and then you could care less about it. So even though you're repeating the sin, thinking that I could never leave this, 
Always do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you're sincere to Allah, Allah will find a way out for you and you'll start to find those avenues to stay away from it. Wallahu ta'ala.